Good morning. It is Friday morning and that means I've got a live stream for you guys today. I want to show you guys my cute shirt that says every day I get emails. Ah! And um, I ordered that from another artist and the card is in the kitchen so I can't tell you who did it off the top of my head. I apologize. But uh, if you ask, I'll let you know down in the comments below. Cause I thought their stuff was really cute and I'd gotten Joseph like a goldfish shirt from them. So I'll probably order stuff from them in the future. So before the live stream at six today, I want to finish up on the PWC field test. Let me adjust the camera so you guys can see what I'm talking about. And uh, spoiler, I really like PWC watercolors. Technically this isn't my first time using them. Um, it's just the first time I've painted exclusively with them. The selection I have here is weird because I originally I part I, I purchased the six piece set and then like um, a yellow ochre and um, maybe like the indigo and um, one other color from David's Art Supplies way back when and then I liked them so much in my initial unboxing swatch that I've just been buying like whatever colors are not really common in my watercolor collection so um, a lot of more opaque colors and uh, so the selection that's in this little meeting tin here this little 24 color tin is real weird and it doesn't even reflect all of the PWC colors I have so I just ordered a 48 slot meeting tin for my PWC watercolors um, I really do like them for this piece I got kind of just carried away with the watercolors themselves and um, so I'm actually not super happy about the piece. It's not quite what I envisioned. I did too many, in my opinion, I did too many colors because I was trying to mess around with a variety of the colors and mix them. So sometimes when I paint something for a field test, I handle it a little differently than I would a normal watercolor because I might work with a larger color gamut because I want to test how the color is mixed or I might do more layering because I want to check the opacity and whether they relift and rework and rewet. So there's certain properties I'm looking for in field tests that if I'm just painting something for aesthetic reasons, um, I wouldn't necessarily do those things or I might do them, but I might do them in a different order. And it doesn't erode the validity of the field test because I'm testing a wider gamut of things. I'm looking for, for issues that I might need to bring up. Um, but that's why sometimes my field tests are not my favorite, but you know what? It doesn't matter anyway, because the dad or the adult is cute. The kiddo is super cute. Um, I think, I hope people will like this. I want to offer it in a series of colored Lilliputian postcards. So um, when you keep in mind that it's not a standalone illustration, but it's part of a set. And it was originally from Lilliputian Living 2019. So the botanical one. Um, then it kind of doesn't have to stand alone. It doesn't have to be like a perfect illustration because it's not designed to stand alone. It's part of a series. So um, even though I'm not super duper happy with how I handled it, and part of that is my own weird color selection because there's a lot, there's like a hot pink in here. There is like two opaque greens and an opaque light blue, three opaque purples, an opaque pink and an op two opaque pinks. So like, those are not colors I'm going to use in something like this because those are kind of like special effects colors in my mind. I handle the opaque colors a little differently than I handle like regular watercolors. So um, anyway, I'm going to finish this up. I want to do some narration on the Shizen Hot Press sketchbook that I got. And um, I'd like to start editing the Sennelier, the Schutt, and the um, Paul Rubens 
watercolor pads today since um, I'm trying to kind of slowly work my way back into also releasing regular content. And from what I see with what you guys watch and comment on, the reviews are something I should continue to do. Um, so, um, and I've got a bunch of stuff already that I wanted to talk to you guys about, so that's not the biggest deal. It's just um, hard juggling because when you are just a review channel and you're buying everything out of pocket, you either need a huge Patreon base or you need companies sending you stuff and neither of those are really in my cards. So it's just figuring out um, how to space things out, how to make things work. It's just logistics on my end. So anyway, um, I wanna get painting today, I wanna get narrating today, I wanna get editing today, and then we have a stream at six that I hope you guys will enjoy. I feel like that one's gonna be like me outdoing myself because that thing is so neat and we, I haven't unboxed it, but like if it works, it's a $20 Crayola ear compressor airbrush for markers, like, and they've pulled that thing often on the market for years because there was a time period a couple years ago where I really wanted, when I was doing a lot of Crayola stuff, on the channel and I really wanted to get a hold of one to review and they were just used ones and I was like I wonder why Crayola pulled it I don't know um and they also have a chalk airbrush which um I would I wish I would love to do ch sidewalk chalk art again like I did for my mom's driveway I don't think my landlady would be see I, I feel like she would act supportive to have something kind of snarky to say about it so I haven't even tried um, because she definitely has artistic taste, but I don't think what I do counts as art to her, which is fine, but it's, you know, like I would like to do it, but there's a reason why I haven't yet. And if it worked, it would make doing bigger pieces easier than just like, you know, running through a piece of chalk, trying to get that color. And you also get flatter color. Like years ago, uh, my friend Heidi Black and I participated in a sidewalk chalk contest and uh, it was in Savannah, so it was a festival. And um, we found the best way to get like a large area covered was to make a chalk paint, paint that on, and then add your details on top. So if the airbrush works like that, then I could see it working, but I can also see it clogging. But I haven't bought it yet because I don't have a use case for it right now. So that's that's a later, but it would be so nice to do like once every two weeks, like a nice message or a nice illustration on the driveway and to also, it'd also be some good advertising maybe. I don't know, I'm trying to think outside the box and think local and think affordable and think not social media because social media just eats what I post. So anyway, let's get to the cracking, huh? Thank mm -hmm. you. show with share it with you guys so I want to make sure that I explain it correctly so I'm gonna read it to you it's a really short email I received it from Tatiana Arnold at Kirkus and it says I hope this email finds you well I'm writing to let you know that 7 inch Kara has been selected by our indie editors to be included in the February 1st issue of Kirkus Reviews 
Congratulations on the feature. Less than 10% of indie authors are selected for this. Your review will be included as one of 35 reviews in the indie section of the magazine, which goes out to industry professionals, literary agents, publishers, booksellers, film executives, etc. And they were reaching out to me to ask if I wanted to take out an ad. Um, yeah, the, the, the ad part is kind of like, but that's still really cool. Um, so I kind of shared this online elsewhere and I read the original Kirkus reviews to you guys during a live stream. So I'll just link that, I guess, if I can find the live stream. But the thing is that Kirkus reviews are really important whether you are published through a big name publisher, a super tiny publisher, or you're self-publishing. Kirkus reviews are important because that's what librarians and teachers read when they are selecting books for their library. So for Kirkus to give you a favorable review, it doesn't always have to be 100% perfect, but for them to like your book, it's going to make it a lot easier to convince librarians and teachers to give your book a shot. And this is particularly important for me because even though I started 7-inch Kara right after Smile came out, so right when people were maybe starting to think that girls read comics, and right when people were starting to think that maybe, I don't know, kids read comics, uh, that's when I started Kara. And even though I have been really happy to watch that market boom and to watch many people I know find work and find success and find homes for their projects, I never benefit, okay, pro that's probably not 100% true, but I never felt like I really benefited from that, despite helping do a lot of the groundwork, going to a lot of shows, talking to a lot of parents, going to ALAAC, talking to a lot of librarians, and just doing a lot of positive PR for comics for young readers. I told you guys way back, I did my thesis, my master's thesis on how comics are actually supportive of literature and can be a great teaching tool for anyone of any age, really, as long as they have, they are cited, uh, anyone of any age to gain literacy skills and not just literacy, literacy skills. Comics are also great for teaching cause and effect, teaching emotions, and um, also helping people who might struggle with understanding, let's, let's use this as an example, people who say one thing and do another, helping them kind of understand those situations a little bit better. I really think comics are great. Comics has thoroughly broken my heart, but I really do think comics as a medium are great. So, um, you guys know I kickstarted volume two in July. We just barely hit the goal. It took a lot of work and a lot of bad things happened that month to prevent me from promoting it the way I really wanted to. And COVID also happened, so that changed things even more. But we did hit the goal. We were able to order about a thousand copies of Seven Inch Care Volume Two. And now we've got all these books and we need to sell them. And Baker and Taylor agreed to take us on but we've been having a lot of back and forth with our liaison because A, she's a little rude to be frank because she keeps assuming we never send in the paperwork rather than checking to see if we send in the paperwork. So we keep resending the paperwork and then she keeps assuming we didn't send that paperwork in. Girl, check your spam folder, I guess. Um, so we're not making a lot of progress with Baker and Taylor, but they also kind of dragged the process out by months. It took them months to get back to us. Then they accepted us and we haven't heard much. So we need to get that fixed before the Kirkus thing goes live. Fingers crossed. And then we also applied to Diamond months and months and months ago. And we never heard anything back despite them being like, yeah, 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 we will pass this along. We'll get back to you. And I don't think this is not a personal thing. I do not think we, me and Joseph are like, there's a vendetta or anything ridiculous like that. I do think this is something that indie creators face on the regular that our work is, even if it is good enough, it is not treated like it's good enough. It's not given respect. It's not given consideration, not by the readers, but by the industry itself. Um, and I've talked about this before, but when I was a member of SCBWI Mid-South, for the three of the four years I was a member there, they were very dismissive of self-publishing and indie publishing. I made friends with a girl, a girl who was the same age, uh, and she made a bunch of money writing novels and then selling them on Kindle. She didn't do any of the traditional publishing anything, and she was seeing all the money. 
And so many writers at SCBWI, when they found out she was self-publishing, were super condescending to her. And that's not everyone. That's just kind of still unfortunately pervasive. If you're self-publishing, it's because you're not good enough for traditional publishing, right? If you got a webcomic, it's because you're not cut out for real comics, right? And the only way that's going to change is by those of us in the indie sphere pushing our boundaries, pushing our luck, and demanding the same opportunities that are afforded to larger groups. That's one of the reasons we joined IBPA. It's the Independent Book Publishers Association. And it's because they're able to get you discounts on, because those are the discounts that are offered to industry. Uh, they're able to get us a lot of the same kind of discounts for our independent books. So that's pretty cool. And uh, the Kirkus Review was actually on, on sale. So uh, normally a Kirkus Review was like $300, which is a lot of money to pay for a review. Uh, but we paid two fifty for it, and I'm kind of hoping that it will really pay off. Just having a positive Kirkus Review or your reviewer liked your book um, helps a lot. So I don't, we didn't do it for Volume 1. But I think Volume 2 was a good time to do it. And in my opinion, Volume 2 is really the stronger book because we're starting to really get into the story now that we know the characters more. So uh, cross your fingers for me. It would be amazing if we could get 7-inch carrot into libraries and schools, if we could get 7-inch carrot into the hands of people who would enjoy it. And um, it was just a nice shot in the arm, you know, a nice uh, panacea to how I've been kind of feeling this week and a good reminder that you can do good work and the internet might not care. So you got to try and take every avenue you can. And you know, so people talk about imposter syndrome a lot and it's usually in relation to you get a thing, you earn a thing, there's an award or an accolade or an opportunity and you decide you are not good enough. Your head meat tells you you're not good enough you don't deserve it, you somehow trick them. And I always kind of thought, well, I can't have imposter syndrome because I don't have anything. <laughs> so I don't know what I have. Um, but I do think I probably do have a degree of imposter syndrome because I am taking the lack of reception on Twitter and on Facebook and among my comic peers for my comic, I'm taking that as a signifier that I don't deserve to pursue opportunities. I don't put myself out like I should because I've gotten so much silence in return. Um, and I think that could be a type of imposter syndrome true too, because I've taken this very weird reflection of my work to be an accurate reflection of my work. And instead of trying every avenue I can, I let that distorted image convince me that Kara doesn't that I don't deserve to even put myself in, that even if I did, it wouldn't be very good and no one would like it, you know? I talk myself out of opportunities before I even take the opportunities. And I think that's a type of imposter syndrome too, because those opportunities, I, if I were giving this advice to you guys, I would say, take, do it. What do you have to lose? I mean, some of them cost money, sure. But what do you have to lose other than that? If you never take opportunities, you'll never get anything. If you don't play, you don't win. But when it comes to me, I am so exhausted and tired and beaten down and defeated that I'm like, well, that's energy I don't have. So um, I got to work on that too. And I've definitely been working on getting my head speak, how I talk to myself, how I think about myself to match how I would talk to other people. Because like many of you guys, I would never say things to anyone, even someone I don't like. I would never say the things I think about myself to anybody else. I say that for me, that special nasty when I should be talking the nicest to myself because I live in this body. I know this body best. I know this brain best. I know my goals and my hopes and my aspirations better than anyone does. And I can't read other people's minds. So when I'm encouraging them, maybe they're harboring nasty, spiteful thoughts. I don't know, but I know myself. So why am I so hard on myself when I can be kind to other people? So that's something I think we all can work on. Because I think if you can be kinder to yourself, then you'll have the energy to be kinder to other people too. Um, I know that when I hate myself and I'm kind to others, I'm really just digging a hole in myself. I'm taking away from my own self-nurturing to give to them and that's not really healthy. I need to be working on filling up my self-nurturing and then I'll have lots and I can then share. Does that make sense? It's like if you have no food and you give the little, you cut off your arm to feed somebody else, right? You, now you don't have an arm. 
uh, you're not, your arm's not going to grow back. Whereas if somehow you guys could work together to grow some food, you would both have food and then could share it. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, I just wanted to share that good news with you guys. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, so on that note, uh, I got to keep nagging because we still have backer surveys that haven't been filled out. And I really want to get all the books to all the people who bought the books. Please, if you ordered 7-inch Kara Volume 1, Volume 2, or Lilliputian Living through the 7-inch Kara Kickstarter, and you haven't filled out the backer survey, and you haven't gotten your book, because I took, I just took the liberty of, if I, if I, it was like a family member who supported, I just went ahead and sent their books because I know where they live. Um, but if you don't fall in that very specific category and you haven't received your book, check and make sure you filled out your backer survey. And if you did and you still haven't received your book, reach out to me. Um, one of my friends backed the book back for Lilliputian Living and got the other books. And Lilliputian Living was just like swimming in their metro area for like a month. I don't know why. It finally arrived. I'm happy to hear that. But um, reach out to me. We'll try to figure it out. At the very least, we can run the tracking number and see if the book's floating around your metro area or if it got destroyed or something and then we can fix that. But if you haven't filled out the backer survey, please fill out the backer survey so I can get your books to you. And also, if you read 7-Inch Carol, whether it's as a webcomic or you checked it out from the library or you purchased it and you enjoyed it, it would be a huge, huge help. A huge help. This is something I cannot do for myself. It would be a huge help if you would take a moment to leave a review. Um, I have links for the Amazon Volume 1, the Goodreads Volume 1, the Amazon Volume 2, and the Goodreads Volume 2. I'll pop those down in the description below. It costs you nothing. It is such a huge gift, and it tells me people like what I do. If you're reading it as a webcomic, Chapter 4 is the break between Volume 1 and Volume 2. So once you finish Chapter 4, that's Volume 1. Uh, once you finish Chapter 8, which hasn't gone all the way live yet, that's basically the end of volume two. Of course, the print books do have bonus comics and they have bonus art and there's other things to, you know, be my thank you for buying the books. Um, volume one has a short story, Small Blessings, which is about how Kara met Dusty, her pet gecko. Volume two has Naomi's Big Day, which is about Naomi's first day in high school at a whole new school in a small town. So those are going to be, I think I never ran Small Blessings. Uh, it was originally from the Hannah Doka Curie, uh, Doki Curie anthology, but um, I don't think that ever ran on the site. And I know for a fact, uh, Big Day will never run on the site. So if you like Seven Inch Kira and you're reading it as a web comic, there is there are good reasons to back the books because there's extras in there for you guys. But regardless of how you read it, if you enjoyed it, please, 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 please leave a re please leave a review. Uh, even if you didn't like it, leave a review. Um, I want to know your honest thoughts, and that helps other people decide whether it's a good fit for them in their lives. And uh, if you just love the book and you can't afford it, like you love the webcomic, you can't afford it, if you take a minute and fill out a library request form with your local library and request 7-inch Kara Volume 1 or Volume 2 by Becca Hilburn, that would also be a tremendous help, and I would really, really appreciate it. So, sorry to shill, but Kara is my baby. Eh, that comic is years of my life and it is going to be years of my life for volume three and volume four and I would be a remiss comic mama if I didn't promote it and if I didn't encourage you guys to talk about it if you enjoy it uh, especially because I do so many other things on this channel that um, I think I need to talk about my comic work more maybe less tutorials and just more talking about it so anyway I finished up this piece actually ended up liking it more than when I added the highlights, I ended up liking it a lot. Especially this kiddo here is super duper cute. You guys can see a better view of it over on my Instagram. And uh, stream tonight at 6. It's getting kind of later though. It's like 4.10. So I don't know if I'm going to have time to do the voiceover work that I wanted to do before the stream. But maybe I'll do it tomorrow instead. So anyway. It's Friday night, it's time to stream. Actually, in 15 minutes, it'll be time to stream. For now, it is time to get set up. So I am removing the, this used to be an F clamp, but I am removing the uh, F clamp that I usually use to hold my phone. 
and replacing it with my Logitech webcam. As you guys can see, the Rode mic stand can hold either. Pretty handy. It does have an, um, like a little brass adapter on it, but still pretty handy. Not a sponsorship, not affiliated. Gotta twist out some of the kinks. There we go. There we go. And see, really what I wanted to do is have the view from this part of the table, but it's not really feasible. That's why when I'm um, streaming in the living room, I use a totally different setup. Okay, so I use OBS. If it'll open, it will. I will update you later. Everything's looking good so far. So I'll maximize this, not that you guys can see it super well, but uh, I have a main table view and then I have a little face cam. That's this one right here. And I'll also open up YouTube and a whole new window. This is how I have 1,000 tabs, by the way. Go over here to create. This isn't a tutorial. I know you guys know how to do this. Uh, shh, shh, shh. Go away, autoplay. No one wants to hear you. Not even me. Do need to clean up my desk before the stream starts. Then we have our everything's been scheduled already. Probably an opportunity to promote it. Why not? If you don't promote it, people won't watch it or it's harder for them to watch it. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna finish cleaning up. And what I plan on doing is I'd like to capture some footage of the stream from the side cam, uh, just for the vlog. There's something, I am a completionist, I guess. And it's like, oh, I don't like it when I don't have any footage from this thing I did. So that's why you've been getting side cam and stuff. So on February 1st, which is Monday, so you guys will have seen this, February 1st is hourly comic day, and that's when you do a comic panel or a comic strip for every hour of the day. I plan on participating, and I plan on trying to record as much of that as possible, not for a tutorial, but just because it's kind of cool to see it all come together, you know? I have done hourly comic day every day since, I think, my first year of SCADs. So I should have so many of these. Where did they all go? I do not do 24 hour comic day though because that just does not mesh with my process. There have been years when I used 24 hour, hour comic day though to accomplish a set goal. Like I'm, I was like, I'm gonna work until I get the script done or whatever. Cause sometimes working along with the energy that everybody else is working with kind of keeps you pumped. So anyway, it's time for me to promote the stream. Bo thinks he's going outside. It is dark outside, that ain't happening. So hopefully I'll see you guys in the stream.
the stream. My phone actually quit recording midway. It doesn't really matter because this is going to be available for live replay if you guys want to check it out. I recommend you do because um, this was a very straightforward quick stream. I really didn't spend a lot of time just chit chatting with people too, too much. Not that I don't want to, but the topic itself was so engaging that it kept me kind of what next, what next, what next. So um, what's weird is the Crayola one works really, really well with wide line markers and with a little bit of modification, I think I can get it to work with Prismacolors and Ohuhus. My Copic thing basically didn't work at all. I just got some real pathetic little spurts and it killed the bullet, I'm sorry, the chisel nib on one of my Copic sketches. Now the thing is, I have a comic artist friend, MJ, who does Copic and alcohol marker comics. Uh, I'll link it in the description. You guys should check out her work. She's really great with markers and her color theory, color stories are also phenomenal. So I highly recommend you check out her work if you like markers. And she uses the ABS for a lot of her backgrounds. And my friend Kabocha uses the ABS or used to use the ABS all the time. And I couldn't even get it to work. And it seems like it's such a straightforward concept. So maybe mine has gone bad over the years, but it was, it was spritz in air um, and my markers weren't dead. So I don't know. Uh, but like I said, in stream, you know, not every art supply is for every artist. That's why I like YouTube. You get people who love a thing, you get people who hate a thing and both have really valid reasons. So it kind of gives you a more nuanced take instead of just the store saying, yeah, buy this thing, this thing is great. So and so famous artist uses it. I mean, you know, a really talented artist can make any, a really skilled and talented artist can make any product, no matter how bad work for them. There are people who paint with gross things, let's just say. Um, that doesn't mean you should go do it. So um, I, I don't, I've never used this. I used the little spray bottles of alcohol ink. So I'm not missing out. It's not like my life is poor. I'm just kind of confused because Copic makes good products. I didn't like the gas and food aid, but in general, Copic makes good products. Why is it that this Crayola thing that gets a gasket seal is possibly, and has an air compressor, so you're not using compressed air, why is it that this thing is better than the Copic thing for other people? Like, I don't even know. So um, that was fun. I had a good time. I wish Crayola made more cool little nifty, they do, okay? But like, it's like spin art. It's hard for me to justify buying, like this one, I could kind of justify it because I wanted to try it with alcohol markers and I still think I can get it to work. Um, but it's harder to justify some of the other neat Crayola things because I don't have a kid, you know? I don't need a light table. I have a, light, I have a really expensive light table. Uh, so it's harder to justify it. Anyway, that was fun. Uh, I am resuming my Friday night streams, but I'm going to be doing flower painting for most of them, unless I come across another cool thing like this that I'm like, I want to play with it. Let's do a stream. Uh, anyway, I, what am I even doing for the rest of tonight? It's like 7.30 and I don't know what I'm doing with myself because I finished that watercolor and I played with my toy. Uh, do I, what is this free time? I don't understand. Wait, now I remember what I'm doing. I'm gonna go narrate a video. So next, I wanna do some voiceover work on one of my reviews. So I'm gonna be doing the She's in Hot Press watercolor sketchbook. And no joke, I will show you guys what, what I record onto. First of all, I wanna say on my new phone, which is what I'm recording with right now, you currently can't use the in-phone video editor to add narration on top of something. So I have to use my old phone for that still because I'm a genius and uh, I need to just load the AKG for this app onto the new phone. Um, burp, 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 burp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the new one. I'm recording in the back bedroom because um, there's just more soft things in here and you get less echo. I've tried also using the lavalier mic and I don't think the quality is appreciably better. 
Uh, I used to record in my bedroom in Nashville and had way more soft things up so I could get really nice audio. I've also recorded in closets before, but this closet is full of boxes from moving. Uh, ideally, I'd set up, a, I would just record narration in a closet uh, in our own home or put up egg crate if I had to. I don't think what I do requires like perfect audio enough to be worth setting up specifically a recording space. So it's, it's pretty <laughs> straightforward, but I thought I'd share this part of the process with you guys because why not, but I am going to do it in time lapse. with the narration it's just time to add some music edit it get it uploaded screen it make sure it's good and then hopefully it can be scheduled if not then I have to fix whatever I did wrong the first time whether it's forgetting to scrub audio from some of the video clips or the music's too loud or what have you um, sometimes you miss stuff even if you're careful and you double check so it usually takes me a little bit longer to pump out videos because of those limitations and yes i could be editing on a computer all the smart cool kids are doing it but i'm not smart and i'm not cool so what's left for that one is uh music and in screen and beginning screen uploading etc who i don't know man like doing narration for 45 minutes straight just like wears me out it's to the point where i have to like keep my eyes closed if I'm not reading because for some reason my brain gets too much stimulation and then I stumble on my words a lot more. So to give as clean narration as possible, I work from a script and work with my eyes closed, which is not smart when you're narrating on top of art. Come on, ADHD. All right. Well, uh, it's not late, but it's not early. I might call it a day and just finish uploading this video and then um, edit this vlog too because for my weekly vlogs I do edit every day independently and then I edit them all. guys good day it is saturday i say good day not good morning because it's to time and uh we're hoping to head out and take some promo photos of volume two volume one and lilliputian living just out in the wild i'm also kind of hoping i can get some photos for the king cake mardi gras promotion i want to do we'll see though and that depends on me getting a king cake uh so the plan is to bring a few copies of the book out, some book stands, some cameras, and just take some photos of Seven Inch Care Volume 1 and Volume 2 and Lilliputian Living out in nature with plants, that sort of thing. Um, we have a bunch for Volume 1 from last year that were taken in Nashville. Like we have uh, one for every season. <laughs> Seems like a good idea, right? Um, the thing about promoting stuff is you need lots of promotional material prepared because people get tired of looking at the same stuff over and over and over and over again and uh, that's why I really like using Canva and this isn't a sponsorship whatsoever. I do pay myself for pro though and that also gives me access to like animated graphics that I can use here on the channel which is pretty cool. It's a little pricey but I really use it all the time. I have terrible graphic design skills and Canva makes it look like somebody who kind of knew what they were doing did the design instead of me who doesn't do graphic, is terrible at graphic design, just point blank. So uh, the main gist of today, I think, I hope, is to get some good photos. Uh, I want to start in the backyard and then I want to like hit a couple parks. Uh, I'm also going to bring some of the art drop bags just in case we pass any little libraries because that's something I've been trying to consistently do. And um, 
maybe get some painting done tonight. So this week's vlogs all ran long. So I'm gonna try to keep this one short. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but I'm gonna try. So a lot of today is either gonna be like little three second clips or in time lapse, but I hope you guys enjoy just doing some regular art life stuff with me. So let's go. Okay, so this is one of the picturesque spots we found. Lots of Spanish moss right across from the volunteer fire department, whatever that is. Busy roads and a bolero. So here we are at the scenic St. Charles Parish, Mississippi River Levee on the East Bank side. Uh, we're trying to get some half decent photos that include the Hale Boggs Bridge because I don't know about y'all, but for me, as somebody who grew up on the West Bank, uh, the Hale Boggs Bridge was always kind of a sign of being home, you know, because to get back from like Mississippi visiting my grandparents or from town even, you got to cross the Hale Boggs Bridge. Now, I'm sure for people on the East Bank, they don't feel that way because they don't got to cross that bridge except to go to the West Bank. But, you know, as a West Bank girl, I thought it was home. Now, here's the problem. We got something straight out of the Badlands of Lion King, right on the other side of the levee. So we're not going to get any pretty shots in the Mississippi River from this levee, but I'm pretty sure on the West Bank side you can get some nice shots of the Mississippi River. And then over at the Bridge Park, they're doing an RV show or an RV race right now. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so theoretically we are heading from Destrehan to Norco. If we just kept going all the way down this levee, eventually you'd hit the spillway, but first you'd hit Norco. Okay, so we're on the West Bank now, and as you guys can see, you get a much clearer view of the river. Yum, yum, chicken from Popeye. 